morning, church. Let's stand together and sing. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, welcome everyone. It's, it's good to be here this morning with you. Um, I'm struck by the last verse, uh, the words of the last verse of that hymn. The potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. Christianity alone says this radical thing that the creator of the rolling spheres would also be our redeemer, uh, who would himself be our mediator and our sacrifice. Uh, we're going back into the book of Hebrews now uh, for a few more weeks and, and looking at the awe-inspiring mystery that Christ is the greater redeemer, the greater mediator, and the greater sacrifice. We'll be opening the word together in a few moments, but let's continue right now in worship with the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. So 
Today's lesson is from the book of Hebrews in chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. and Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven himself, now to appear in the presence of God on your behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year, with blood not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all to the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But as it is, and just it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand with me as we read our psalm together. Our psalm is a portion of Psalm 68. Let's read it together in unison. Praised be the Lord daily. Even the God who helps us and pours his benefits upon us. He is our God, the God from whom salvation comes. God is the Lord by whom we escape death. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were taking with each o- talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. 
Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that he had, they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Thanks, Ben. As we remain standing, let's pray together. Jesus, uh, I do ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would make clear what is a difficult passage to us. And uh, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that through your Holy Spirit, uh, we can not just know about you, but we can know you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's be seated. So shortly before Holy Week, we've been examining some of the biggest Old Testament themes rather sequentially. God's covenant with his people, established and then maintained through sacrifice, mediated by priests in the temple, which stood in the midst of everything they knew. And Hebrews says to us, basically, Christ is like all of those things, only bigger. Before we leave the events immediately bracketing Easter, I think it's just worth looking at what Jesus says in our gospel reading today. There's two men walking along the way, and as they walk, the newly resurrected Jesus joins them, and he says, what are you talking about? And not recognizing who he was, they explain to this stranger how Jesus had been condemned to death and crucified. But, verse 21, they say, We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They're still thinking in very limited terms. They'd hoped that he would restore the old covenant. That was their hope. And so verse 17 says they stood still looking sad. It means gloomy. They were crestfallen. They were disappointed with Jesus. Verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? You've misunderstood the covenant part quite badly, but you've overlooked the temple priest and sacrifice part entirely, it seems. And so verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All the prophets, all the scriptures, all of the Old Testament, and all of the major things in it are all about him, Jesus says. Now, you know, frustratingly, we don't know exactly what it is that Jesus said to them, but we can assume that it was more or less similar to what we find in the book of Hebrews. And in chapter 9 of Hebrews... The author does the same thing by saying that Jesus is a big version of everything that they knew. Let's turn to chapter 9 of Hebrews. And as you find it, I need to mention in the original language, the structure made a great deal of sense to them. Uh, It makes a lot less sense to us. And if you want to know more about that, uh, you can listen to the podcast. For now, just know this. We're going to see a lot of major concepts from the Old Covenant appear all at once in chapter 9 and swirl around and reappear again. It's just a, a kind of like the author of Hebrews has loaded everything they knew into a shotgun and just shot it onto the page. That's about the idea. So we're going to jump around the passage quite a lot. You want it open. Chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest... Through the greater and more perfect tent, brackets, temple. Verse 12, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood. Under the old covenant, 
It was the high priest's job to enter into the most holy part of the temple. Uh, And in the presence of God, he would atone for people's sins with a sacrifice of blood. So, covenant, temple, priest, sacrifice for sin, some of the biggest concepts in the Old Testament swirling around in chapter 9. The priests. Of course, being sinners, like everyone else, first had to purify themselves. And with everything around them made with human hands, the hands of sinners just like them, everything they used in the temple had to be purified as well. Verse 22 explains, indeed, under the law, under the law of the old covenant, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So blood for the priest, blood for the instruments and the implements and the tools of his trade, likely reminding them where it all started with a covenant from God, verse 18, inaugurated with blood. You see how blood and sin and forgiveness are linked so strongly here. The original promise of the original old covenant that Yahweh made with the people of God was to bless them and curse their enemies and to furnish them with a promised covenant land, one that was groaning with with abundance uh, for free. And that covenant began, that is to say it was sealed with blood. Through repeated sacrifice, people were reminded over and over again that God is holy, that sin is real, that sin comes with a cost, and that the price of our release from sin is death, and that God in his grace has always, right back to the start, always provided a substitutionary sacrifice for them to inaugurate, atone, purify over and over and over again with blood. Now Hebrews says, you guys are really into this old covenant stuff, you Hebrews, but it was all inherently flawed, all of it. Flawed sacrifices made by flawed priests working in a temple that was equally flawed. The old temple, like all the old stuff, verses 11 and 24 say, was made with human hands. It was the very best thing they had, but having been made by people who were inherently flawed, and it was operated by people who were inherently flawed, and it was filled with sacrifices that were inherently flawed. It was, guess what? Inherently flawed. Verse 23 describes the temple as merely a copy of that which it points to, and no more. Copy. It's another one of those rare words in Hebrews. It's filled with rare and unusual words. And... uh, Copy is one of those words that when you look it up in a Greek concordance provides you with even more complicated words that you then have to go and look up in a dictionary. Uh, It describes copy as an adumbration. I'd love to know how many of us know what adumbration means. Um, I had to look it up. It means a shadow, a faint sketch, an outline, an imperfect portrayal or a representation of a thing. So the temple that stood in their midst, that the building that they considered to be the epicenter of the universe, to be the the kind of locus of all of their covenant hope, the biggest thing they knew, the, the thing that dominated the scene, not just physically but spiritually as well, was but a blueprint for something even bigger, like a little artist's rendering of the real thing. Therefore, Verse 23 suggests that the real temple, heaven itself, requires an even greater sacrifice than anything they'd seen before to be made by an even greater priest. One that is, in the words of verse verse 14, without blemish. We need someone flawless. Three times, verses 12, 14, and 15, eternal. Why say eternal three times? Because we don't believe it. We need some eternally flawless priest. If we're going to break out of this cycle of sin and atonement and sin and atonement and sin and atonement that characterizes the whole of the Old Testament and be readied for something greater, we're going to need a sacrifice and a priest 
that is perfectly infinite and infinitely perfect. Like what they knew, only bigger. Now, verse 24 says that is precisely who Jesus is. That he's gone there. He's gone into the real thing. Gone into heaven itself. Gone into perfect infinity on our behalf like a priest. And what he's done, verse 26, is to sacrifice himself like a sacrifice. Clearly, this is the language of covenant. But Christ has not merely restored the old covenant as those disciples along the way had hoped. He's inaugurated one that is entirely new. It's not a a reboot of the old. It's a rebirth of something new, a new covenant of which verse 15 says he is the mediator. Now, I, I used to go to mediations when I had a real job, and uh, I would, uh, you would get different parties to a dispute uh, when there was a mediation, and they would go into different rooms, usually in a hotel or something like that. And the mediator, who was a senior lawyer, more often a judge, uh, would, would just run between the rooms, taking offers and counter-offers back and forth, and uh, coming in and encouraging people to, to maybe back down. He would, he would try and use charm to persuade you, uh, or sometimes lean on you to, to kind of frighten you into backing down, or maybe uh, encourage you to phrase your arguments a little bit differently, uh, or, or compromise somehow and make suggestions for you. I was quite young when I came to one in Atlanta, where I think as a young man, I I tried the patience of the mediator a bit too much. Um, He described me as being like a child who would poke a skunk, get away with it, and poke it again. Um, He said to me, son, we have a saying in these parts, uh, you don't poke a skunk twice. Um, My London accent is probably more convincing, but uh, that's all I got. Uh, and, then he, and then he said to me, I, I didn't know what skunks were. Uh, I, I thought they were like squirrels, so I was like, oh, let's keep poking. What harm can it do? Uh, then he said, uh, son, I think the best thing you could do right now is to back down. And uh, I said to him, what's the second best thing I could do? <laughs> Give it another poke, right? Um, it is a very tough job being a mediator. And he was using every tactic in the book, kind of charm and then aggression, Uh, to push me around and manipulate me so that at the end of this exhausting three-day process, the two sides that were poles apart would make a deal and slowly crab towards a point in the middle. Christ is a very strange mediator because we're not meeting in the middle. We're moving wholly onto God's side, 100%. As verse 15 puts it, we shall receive an eternal inheritance, a full change of status that will never change or fade away. We are to enter into the perfect temple in full for ourselves and move wholly onto his side, not somewhere in between. How do we get there? Through the work of Christ. Through his work, the barrier of sin has been removed, as verse 26 puts it. Put away. It literally means abolished. That that sin has been effectively rendered completely defunct uh, and, and, and drained of all of its effects permanently. It is remarkable at the end of a mediation to find yourself wholly on the other side, 100% but then to discover that it was your mediator who paid the full price of you being there on your behalf, even his life, and then deigning to call it a mediation just blows my mind. It's an incredible image. But that's the swirling argument of chapter 9. That's the load up all the terminology into a shotgun approach that we find right here. He's a priest, he's a sacrifice, he's perfect, he's infinite, he's eternal, he's like everything they knew, only bigger. He's reminiscent of the old covenant. He inaugurates and mediates something entirely new. By conceding so much, it kills him, and yet having died, being perfectly eternal and eternally perfect, he is yet alive, and now he's calling us to be with himself, to begin a new life with him in the perfect and true temple of which the old one was but a poor copy, 
regardless of the actual sin you have actually committed or any of your feelings about it, its effects have been completely put away and you are welcome in the court of the king. Hebrews chapter 9 is like the graphic on our bulletin cover, isn't it? Here's everything we know, all at once, sometimes repeated and blasted onto the page, and then standing alone, unique in the middle, is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, he's everything, absolutely everything. I've used up so much time uh, just to walk through the complex structure of of chapter 9, and uh, we're kind of still stuck on the explain it part. But I do have three simple points for us. They're quite quick. First, so the sermon begins. Uh, First, verse 28, having dealt with sin as a perfect sacrifice and priest, he will return to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So are you? Are you eagerly waiting for him? Just one word in Greek, rare, of course, And it means to look expectantly. So are you? Are you looking expectantly for Jesus? Are you ordering your life such that Christ is in full view? So that he dominates the scene like the old temple did? Does he stand in the center of your life? Like this graphic? Or have you shoved Jesus to one side? Because some other concern has gotten in between of you? Well, you might say, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure. What does eagerly waiting really look like? Well, on Monday, there will be an eclipse, which God has perfectly timed so that exhausted preachers can have an easy illustration after Easter. I believe that's the only reason for it. Uh, And so in every single church in the land, every single preacher is going to be talking about it today. Uh, So, you know, why be anything other than dull? Let's do it. Kat's cousin last week, staying with us, he booked a hotel room for the journey from Buffalo, and um, he booked the wrong week. And he saw that hotel prices along the path of totality had escalated by 600%. People are very excited about the eclipse. They will drive for hours to go from a 97.4% view like ours to the full thing to have it dominate their view. Uh, People have actually traveled from all over the world. Becky O'Connor at lunch yesterday was telling me four million people have traveled into the path of totality, uh, and they've prepared. We we bought special glasses. Uh, We don't use our phone to just look at it on a screen or do the pinhole shoebox thing. Uh, we, We don't want it to see a faint copy or an outline on a screen. We want to fix our eyes on the thing directly, so we bought glasses. Schools have early dismissal. Our scout troop has gone up to Erie and camped in the snow for three days to see it. The Washington Post, and don't judge me, I don't habitually read it, uh, found that inmates in New York jails have actually sued the state to be allowed to go outside to see the eclipse this time. And we're all going to line up, (laughs) almost as equals, with our eyes fixed upon the sky to see this thing. And we're going to wait, and we're going to watch in awe, and that is eagerly waiting. That's what it looks like. So does that describe your attitude to Christ? Have you traveled and spent money and shelved plans and fought for the right to learn about him? Have you put the word directly into your own hands and read it? Or are you content to hear about him from someone else? My pastor saw him. Well, so what? I'm not your priest. I can't do this Christianity thing for you on your behalf. The scholar Donald Guthrie says that if you're not eagerly waiting, you're probably not a Christian. First point, Christians eagerly wait. Second, The reason why they're so eager is because they've understood his work is done. So don't turn eagerly waiting into a work, will you? Don't 
say, all right, I've got to eagerly wait now and get my eagerly waiting right so that God will love me. Don't become your own priest. Don't hear how great Jesus is and go, oh, okay, right, now I have to sacrifice this thing to propitiate my God and atone for sin and make his face to shine upon me through this sacrifice that I'm making. Verse 25 says, his work will never need to be repeated again by him and certainly, therefore, not by you. Decisively, he has put away sin, verse 26, abolished it, securing for us, verse 12, an eternal redemption, not a questionable one, not a temporary one either. He did this on our behalf, like a high priest, only bigger. Under the old covenant, it would have been utterly unthinkable for you to barge your way into the temple and to go into the Holy of Holies and do the high priest's job for him. Don't do it with Christ. Unless you want to become the sacrifice as well. No more works. The work is done. That's the gospel. Look at verse 14. Compared to all the old sacrifices... How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Third point, therefore, let's serve. The word serve is laden with irony. It's linked to the word for work. The work is done, let's go to work. No more work, let's go to work. Uh, It's also linked to the concept of a priest. It means to worship. It describes not just work generally, but the actual work of a priest. Don't be a priest. Let's go and be priests. Don't work. Don't be a priest. Let's go to work. Let's be a priest. Swirling, is it not? Chapter 9. But it's a very different type of priestly work that we've all been called to. It's like everything we knew, only bigger. A new kind of priestly work opportunity is opened up through Jesus Christ. And it's one that revolves solely around praising him for what he has done. That just revolves around waiting eagerly and fixing your eyes upon him and and thanking him in endless praise until he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And he is to dominate our view until he returns. Let's pray. Lord Jesus... uh, Thank you for uh, cramming the totality of of the Christian faith into half a chapter. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be thrilled to behold the work you have achieved for us Uh, and to to sense that calling now to to come and be little priests of a kind, uh, all of us. Priests, though, of a new thing, not ones that are, are laden with guilt, but ones that know so drained of the effects of sin that uh, we already have a foot in the eternal temple through you. And so, Lord, would you help us to worship and praise and wait and fix our eyes upon you and, and be thrilled by you? And would you give us new discoveries day after day after day through your word, through our groups, through, through the work of your spirit uh, as to who you are and what you've done? In Jesus' name, amen. Turning to page three, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please kneel or be seated. Let's pray for the whole state of Christ's church and for the world that he died to redeem and over which he rules. For the peace of the whole world, especially in those places that are torn apart by war and famine. We pray for those in Burma, Myanmar, uh, for those people who are oppressed, especially um, in Western China, for those in the Ukraine and in Israel-Palestine who are suffering. Lord, will you cause wars to cease? Will you break the bow and shatter the spear? And by your power, bring your kingdom, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our archbishop, for Alec, our bishop, for Alex, our rector, and for all the pastors and people of this diocese and this congregation here gathered. We pray that you would meet every need and keep our eyes focused upon your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, will you give your church universal good leadership so that we would be united in you and bring about your glory and keep our eyes upon you. Especially we pray for those who are persecuted for their faith, both at home here in the United States in little ways and those whose very lives are in danger. Will you preserve us for your glory? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. We ask, Lord, especially that you guide over this uh, election year Will you bring godly counsel and wisdom to our rulers so that injustice would be curbed and righteousness would prevail? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in any kind of trouble, in faith crisis, in physical or financial need, in chronic sickness, or any other adversity, especially the people whose lives are closely knit with ours, who we now name. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you told us in your word that you intercede on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. And our formulaic prayers in this service are only a, a reflection of that deep groaning that you have on our behalf. Will you make us increasingly to be a people who are in prayer for every single need? And will you meet all of our needs with the riches of your grace in, in Christ Jesus? Amen. And Lord, we humbly confess our sins now, as we say together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me. And hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so may the peace of the Lord be always with you. you. Let's greet one another with God's peace. Peace be with you. Let's take our seats. We've got one or two announcements. Uh, my notes say AF, MG, and STU. Uh, Stu? <laughs> I, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm back again, going into prison again. Uh, about two, two weeks from today I will be the, sort of the end of a, another Kairos weekend at SEI Green near Waynesburg. Pennsylvania. And I'm here to ask for your help by signing up to pray for us on a prayer vigil for an hour. We think uh, what makes uh, this program work is the prayers that surround this activity. The, The residents, as we politely call them, are really blown away by the fact that people will be praying for them who don't even know them. So it's an important factor in the success of the program. And I'd ask you for an hour of prayer. I'll give you enough material that you would not be able to get through in an hour. But you can use it as suggested prayers. And in doing that, I think you're really responding to uh, Jesus' call to Uh, visit people in prison. Matthew chapter 25, verse 36. So I'll be outside looking for some sign-ups. Please help. Thank you, you, Stu. We appreciate that. Uh, AF means... One more more thing. Go on, then. Go on, Stu. Sorry. Say it for the internet as well. Sorry. uh, Just uh, for some of you, uh, one of uh, our former congregation members, John Bailey, Father John Bailey, has uh, actually uh, volunteered to serve on that team. So it's really a, really a great opportunity to see him in action. Bye. Maybe, because I had lunch with him yesterday, and he ate a raw salmon, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uh, AF means Adult Forum. Uh, do invite you, please, to come uh, join us in the White Building over there for uh, the Adult Forum, a discussion of this passage. Ben has agreed uh, to lead that, and it is the most complicated passage in the New Testament, so um, you know, good luck, and uh, I do uh, warmly encourage you to come to that. Ben, do you want to say a couple of things as well? Yes. Uh, first off, next Saturday at 6.30 p.m., we have our monthly men's Bible study, so ask yourself... Am I a man? Uh, If the answer is yes, technically yes. That's a Flight of the Concords reference. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. Um, Then then we encourage you to come. Whether you're a regular member, you've come a thousand times, or you came once like a year ago and haven't been back, or you've never been before. Um, This is not a cliquish men's Bible study. It's a time for uh, all the men of the church and those who are on the fringes of the church who maybe have never been to church before. Uh, to come and just have some fellowship on the, under the word. Um, so, uh, uh, ladies, uh, encourage your husbands to come to this. And, and men, uh, I encourage you to come to this. It's a really, really valuable time. Saturday, 6.30 p.m. Uh, second, 
uh, spots are filling up for our youth mission trip. So parents of teenagers, I encourage you, uh, there's forms on the table uh, right outside. Uh, I encourage you to grab one and sign up, get your deposit in. Kids, if you're, students, if you're on the verge of going, not sure whether to go or not, let me just make it easy, go. <laughs> All right, let's sing the doxology in praise of God. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. sit or kneel. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his one offering of himself, once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, 
trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith and with thanksgiving.
Breathe out of the sun. 
purchased by the finished work of Christ, who eagerly wait, get to go forth and serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Just a reminder, the forum is meeting over across the way in the meeting house in about nine minutes. So grab a cup of coffee and make your way on over. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia.